Here is another Android head unit for you. This one has a surprise that you don't want to miss. A company called Max Speed Rods sent this out to me. They must be uh, environmentally friendly because they did not put the box inside of a box when they shipped it. I've never heard of Max Speed Rods. They appear to specialize in aftermarket go fast parts, and this is just one of their many product lines. If you know anything about this brand or this company, share your experiences with them down in the comments. I'm guessing it's supposed to be pronounced Max Speeding Rods. The name makes me think they got their start by making aftermarket connecting rods. Now this unit allegedly has a ton of features. They make the same claims that everyone who sells one of these Android units make. DSP sound, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and on and on and on. They even claim they have a rotating screen, I guess if you want to mount it sideways. Now I'm skeptical. Anybody can slap any claim they want on the side of the box box and a lot of companies put a bunch of just crap on the side of their box. We're going to put this thing to the test. Now inside the box they include some panel tools. That's nice. There are some metal wings that you might use to mount the device and a microfiber cleaning cloth. That's handy. These touch screens just attract smudges. There's an owner's manual and a bag with a bunch of goodies. And of course the unit itself. The front panel has two USB ports, an auxiliary input, a microphone, and a reset button, plus a volume knob. It seems like volume knobs have pretty much disappeared from aftermarket head units, so it's refreshing to see one that includes that feature. Who would have ever thought that a volume knob would become a feature? On the back, you've got a plug for your standard car audio wiring harness, a 15 amp fuse, plus a full-sized HDMI port. There's a fan and a spot for both an FM antenna and a GPS antenna. What about that double row of white plugs? That's for this bag of goodies. In that bag, there is another USB port, the GPS antenna, a standard harness with the power connections and the speaker connections. Here's the input for the backup camera. Then it has this huge bundle that includes a microphone input, so you can jump on Amazon and buy a $10 mic and plug that in for your hands-free calling and your voice controls. Voice control, that's right. This thing allegedly has both wireless and wired Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. I say allegedly until I test it out. I've had a few of these units that just didn't live up to the claims. So I'm always skeptical until I verify it for myself. That harness also has a second video input, a pair of RCA inputs, and a video output. Looking at the rest of the connections on that harness, they're all RCA outputs and they're all labeled as 5.1. Keep watching and we'll find out what's up with that. Let's get it wired up and fired up. The initial boot time is about 45 seconds. There's a cool animation where the speedometer goes up to 200 miles an hour and then back down. From there, you can hit a little icon in the lower left corner to access apps. It is an Android system, so you can log into the Google Play Store and download any Android app that you like. If you swipe down from the top, you get access to the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the DSP, and a few more functions. Let's turn on Bluetooth. Like every other Bluetooth device on the planet, the initial connection is a pain in the rear. But as soon as the Bluetooth connection was made, the device initiated an Android auto connection. I don't use Apple devices, so I can't verify how well Apple CarPlay works. But Android Auto is flawless. It loads right up into the Google Map app, just like any other Android Auto device does. Okay, Google. Navigate to Down for Sound in Las Vegas. Down for Sound is 26 hours from your location by car in light traffic. The touchscreen seems a little imprecise and a bit laggy. I've yet to test one of these that has a fast and responsive touchscreen. Let's connect some speakers and see how it sounds. This is a track from the YouTube library. For those who don't know, YouTube makes some music freely available to YouTubers because if we play popular music, we get copyright strikes. Okay, so I was getting audible distortion at 30 on the volume knob, and by the time it was at max volume, it sounded terrible. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? It's just a thing. That's just where it started sounding bad. And we'll hook it up to some meters here in a second and get a better idea. 
Okay, so the onboard amp doesn't sound too good. Let's hook up some measurement tools and see what's going on. For those who aren't familiar with this technology, the red device is an SMD DD1 Plus. It's gonna light up when we hit 1% total harmonic distortion. which happens at 29 on the volume knob, which is about the point where the drop in sound quality was noticeable. So the test gear did verify what I heard. The blue device is an SMD AMM1. This is also called an amp dyno. The chip inside does some math and displays the power in watts. We get about 10 at 1% total harmonic distortion. The light on this device turns on at clipping. Now the unit never clips even at full volume, but the signal is very distorted at that level and it did sound terrible. This is the thing with these touchscreens that are flooding the market. There's no way to assess the quality without buying it for yourself or hoping someone like me will come along and test them. Now at this point, you may be ready to toss the unit in the trash, but it's got a couple of tricks up its sleeve and I will show you those after I take a second to thank my patrons over on Patreon. With an extra thank you to my $25 patrons, Bo, David, Bam Bam, Dylan, and Baba. I couldn't afford to run any of these tests without the help of my patrons. If you want to see upgrades to the test gear that I use, hit the link below and sign up for Patreon. Now off camera, I've disconnected the amp dyno and I've connected a multimeter oscilloscope. Links to all the test gear can be found down in the video description. These devices are now connected to the RCAs. Most of these head units have crappy two volt RCAs. If you want clean sound running to an aftermarket amplifier, you want four volt RCAs or more if you can get them. So I'm now gonna play a one kilohertz test tone to show you where the RCAs distort and show you the RCA voltage. One reason why I'm running the multimeter is that for some reason the DD1 Plus does not always display voltage. We can see here that the multimeter is showing 4.24 volts. That is a good thing. The head unit is at max volume and the DD1 is not showing any distortion. None at all. The RCA outputs are clean. Now this multimeter has another trick. We can push this button here and display the AC wave and visually inspect for distortion. There is none. The RCAs are clean at full volume. This is important. If you buy one of these, don't bother with the speaker level connections. The internal amp is garbage. Go ahead and grab an external amplifier. I'll give you a link to some of my favorite amplifiers down in the video description. But that's not the surprise I wanted to show you. This thing still has another trick up its sleeve. Check this out, count along with me. This thing has a pair of front, rear, subwoofer, and center RCA outputs. Eight RCA outputs. I have never seen a head unit with this many outputs. Most of these cheap touchscreens are going to have a four or a five channel output. High end name brand units will have five or six. Now I tested all of the front channels with the same result. All of them had over four volts and none of them had distortion at full volume. For the subwoofer output, I switched to a 40 Hertz test track and I got just shy of four volts, 3.93. And of course the oscilloscope is showing a perfect waveform. So what do you do with eight channels of output? If you go into the EQ settings, you get four tabs. The very last tab is labeled frequency. Here you will find a full set of crossovers for all eight channels. And notice this right here, there are three modes, 5.1, two-way, and three-way. 5.1 mode is designed for a center channel. In 5.1 mode, the display shows a pair of speakers up on the dash. Then four channels of output, say at the doors and subwoofer outputs. Two-way gives you outputs for an active two-way front stage plus rear fill and subwoofers. Three-way gives you output for a three-way front stage plus your subwoofers. It's a little bit confusing as to which DSP channel goes to which pair of RCA outputs. I'm gonna show you that in a bit, so make sure you keep watching. From there, you can select the output tab, and this gives you the ability to set the levels for each of the individual channels, mute them, or reverse the phase by 180 degrees by hitting the invert box down at the bottom. <laughs> now the EQ tab <laughs> gives you access to a 14 band fully parametric equalizer. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? You can not only change the level of an individual EQ band, you can also change the frequency of that band and the Q. So this lets you pinpoint a single frequency or control a wide range of frequencies around that equalizer frequency. You could use this for a linkwince transform. You could take the lowest EQ band, set it to 20 Hertz, bring it all the way up, and then set it as wide as possible, and that will give you a boost to those lower frequencies.
the listening tab is where you control the time alignment. And of course, this is a legit device. It's got a full featured eight channel digital signal processor. The only thing that's missing that you might get in a standalone DSP is an equalizer for each channel. This is the Dayton Audio DSP 408. After you purchase a control knob and a USB dongle, it's gonna run you probably over 200 bucks. It does have an individual equalizer for each channel. For about the same money, the max speed rod will give you an entry level standalone DSP that has similar controls, plus wireless Android Auto and wireless Apple CarPlay and a volume knob to go with it. So if you're looking for a DSP, you might want to just skip the entry level units and get this head unit instead. This head unit is an absolute sleeper. I was not expecting any of this. The only thing I can't measure is the long-term reliability, but as far as features go, nothing on the market can touch this unit, even at double or triple the price. But that's only if you plan to use external amplifiers. If you're just looking to drop this in your dash and hook up the speaker level connections, this is a hard pass. When I was testing the crossover, I found something really important. You'll want to see this. The labels on the RCA outputs are a bit confusing. So I went ahead and turned on some 48 dB per octave crossover slopes and connected the unit to my RTA. Now I assume that the RCAs labeled FL and FR, front left and front right, would be the mid-range channels in a three-way front stage. But the RTA shows that these channels are for the tweeters. So I'm gonna swap out the RCAs and I'm gonna plug in the RCAs labeled center. These appear to be mapped to the mid bass. This is where you would connect an amplifier to run a big pair of beefy six inch or six by nines or even an eight inch driver. If you really wanna have some fun, you could order four six inch drivers and slap them into some of these custom speaker pods from customspeakerpods.com. Check the video description for a discount code. The rear channels appear to be the mid range channels. Here's where you would run something like a three inch or a three and a half inch driver. Some people call this a middler. Okay, so how much does that even matter? Probably not much at all because with a digital signal processor, you can route pretty much any signal you want to any channel that you want. But you don't want to accidentally smoke your tweeter by running low frequencies to it. That's why you need an RTA. Click right here and I will show you how to build an RTA dirt cheap. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel. Click the subscribe button right here and I will see you on the next adventure.